dictionary definition of music is the art of arranging sounds in time through the elements of melody, harmony, rhythm, and timbre. Low Pass Filter is a show about the nature of this thing we call music, how it functions in people's lives, how it's contextualized by society, and why we find certain music meaningful. This is Low Pass Filter. Hello and welcome to Low Pass Filter. This is a show where we talk about music and what it means in our lives. My name is Mateo Noche. And I'm here with Low Pass Filter co-host, Bandon Wayne. Hey, Bandon. Hello. How How are you doing? doing? I'm doing all right, man. We're in a a new set this time. Yeah. I figured, I I thought we were maybe getting a little too comfortable in those chairs. We were just kind of of sinking in. (laughs) They were more comfortable than they looked, actually. Yeah. So it's like, sit up straight. Yeah, this will keep us alert. (laughs) That's right. And we even have the uh, community TV ficuses which are yeah. they're, they're stars in their own right. They've appo- appeared yeah. in many, many productions. I think they're going to elevate us to the next level. I think so. When they're you know they'll we'll get our SAG cards just like <laughs> they, they, they've got. Them. So uh, as the regular viewers of the show know, we each month we go back and forth. Uh, one of us picks a topic, um, and this month it's my turn to pick a topic, and this is a topic that I've been kind of circling warily for a while, uh, but I, I'm really interested in, in it, and that's why we like what we like. Why we, and I mean the collective we, not you yes. and me necessarily, although that's interesting as well, but uh, why we like the music that we like. Yeah. Um, it's, I think people don't, or I don't, really give it much thought. It's just like, I like that, and you know, um, I'm not, not really sure why, but um, this this show is going to be an attempt to get to why we like yeah. it. On some level, I might be the opposite, where I, I I'm constantly thinking about what I like or why I like what I like, but in a some kind of constant background or something, some kind of uh, subconscious. But yeah, I think a lot about the music I like. Well, given what you do for a living. Uh, that, you yeah. come in contact with a lot of music and a lot of different people's tastes in music because Indeed. people are always coming to you saying, I'm looking for X, Y, Z. And uh, so you probably need to know about more of this than the ordinary person would. There's that aspect of it. And uh, a lot of times it's just uh, kind of by nature, <clears throat> people coming into the record store want to get into talks about stuff they like, stuff you like. And so a lot of the hours are passed just by discussing, uh, you know, heartily what, what we enjoy. and, and Kind of like this show. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, I think some of the more obvious reasons why people like what they like are things like time and place. Mm-hmm. Your age when you heard something. Indeed. About who you were with, you know, um... Uh, Maybe it was your first girlfriend or, you know, you're running with your set or whatever it was. And then the exo- the associated uh, experiences that, that went along with, with the music. Definitely. When you heard it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, time and place. Um, uh, I think that speaks to the fact that we are all influenced from outside sources uh, in, in terms of what we like. Some of it is our own, uh, you know, internal compass and we discover things on our own but a lot of times it's being exposed to stuff being in a situation where you hear it in a in a certain atmosphere and then it it kind of etches that onto you and then and then it becomes part of you it does uh and then there's how the music makes you feel does it make you feel like getting up and dancing, or does it invoke strong emotions, happiness, sadness, nostalgia? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, kind of maybe tied into the first 
item, you know, time and place and all that stuff. But uh, but I think there's some music that you just uh, hear, you know, and it just it either makes you, you know, I don't know, if sad is the word, but you know, it, it, it nostalgic and maybe wistful. Yeah, and wistful for sure. Yeah, and I think as as we move through time, get older, n- nostalgia becomes a stronger part of it sometimes. Yeah. Um, stuff you you probably liked at one time, but as time passes, it 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 ties to that that time in your life, and and maybe the feelings for it even kind of uh, uh, become enriched because you you really go to it for that sense of yeah. And we'll get to that. I that's a, we'll circle back around to that thought, but uh, there's also uh, music that you at least for me personally that I can't listen to anymore. <laughs> That, that I <laughs> once loved, and not necessarily that I don't love it anymore, it's, and that it's not good, uh, or I've decided that it's not good. It's just uh, the associations are too painful. You know? Yeah, certainly. Uh, yeah, um, ending a relationship that can kill a lot of music for some people, right. um, a loved one, a pet, things like that could make you never want to hear something again. Right. Uh, and then there's just um, that you've heard it too many times there's uh, that, with yeah. popular music, stuff that's played on the radio. You know, we all know the, the examples like Stairway to Heaven and oh, yeah. Sweet Home Alabama and things like that. that yeah, we won't you get know. fooled again. <laughs> 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 and then uh, there are cultural and social reasons um, why you like, like it. Um, maybe it uh, has to do with your heritage, um, or you know, maybe just all the kids are doing it. You know, yeah, <laughs> getting into music because of peer pressure. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to hang with us, you got to like this kind of music. That's right. Yeah. Well, you know, there are actual physical reasons why music, or maybe they don't know why, but that. Music actually does things to your brain, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, it centers in your mal- uh, amygdala. I always have trouble That's with that word, amygdala, <coughs> um, and it and it releases our old pal dopamine. Yep. Yeah. It's you know when they say the music is dope. <laughs> this is what that's, they're talking that's about. What they mean. Yeah. <laughs> uh, directly into your brain, and basically, this is your brain on music. Indeed, if uh, yeah, it's an interesting one because it 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 does have that kind of psychoactive property, like a drug. We don't think of music literally like a drug. We we often say that that uh, you know music is the best drug or something like that. But if we, if we could find a way to to uh, only turn to music when we need that yeah. that that kind of lift. Um, or distraction or whatever it might be. Um, yeah. It, 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 uh, well, you know, there, <coughs> uh, there's music for me, at least personally, that I actually have sensations. You know, I actually, I don't know if the word chills is exactly right, but, you you, you know, like raises the hackles, you know, yeah. sort of. I, I don't know the specific science, but I have seen or heard uh, explanations as to why people get goosebumps when they listen to music. Mm-hmm. Um, it triggers that physiological response. And we all know that sensation, hair standing up on the back of your head. Or but do <coughs> we? Do, 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 do people really, all people react that way? Or is it just... Maybe not all. Yeah. I don't know about that. Um, I certainly know for myself I've had those moments. Yeah. Um, especially with music that... that Maybe all people do. I don't, <coughs> I don't know. I, 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 I think... For me, it's it's generally music that I know very well that's already kind of imprinted on me, mm-hmm. and you're anticipating a part of a song coming up, and you you uh, have had an emotional an emotional response to it before. So as that part's happening, you start to get that tingly sensation. Yeah, you know, I, I think I I think perhaps it is true that not all people experience that. Right. Yeah. Um. And then it's found uh, that uh, sad music releases the the hormone prolactin, uh, which apparently induces calm and relaxation. 
Indeed, I think that might be found in mother's milk, perhaps. I think you're right about that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so brain, the brain process assessing music goes something like this. Sound waves are filtered by the ear. Uh, processing begins based on frequency. And the uh, cochlea, the little mm-hmm. thing in your ear, uh, encodes the pitch. And uh, the auditory pathways in your ear send that uh, encoded information straight into your auditory cortex. Just like a straight shot. That's some heavy stuff, you know. It, uh, no, no matter how much the the science could be clear to to my intellect, it still seems miraculous that that works. And then on top of that, I, I would think that that auditory cortex we don't know for certain, but is designed uh, for natural sounds, communication sounds, uh, fight or flight. Yes, you know, indeed. That whole you, you hear uh, you hear something like a you know a tiger or something you know yeah and yeah. It's, and it's telling your brain you better run if you didn't have that part of your brain you would you would be you'd be gone you'd be you'd be taken out probably yeah but to think that that uh, you know as <clears throat> as long as we've we've been around and and thumped on things and you know, uh, made sounds specifically to uh, to create music. Maybe before we knew what music was, our brains are primed to to receive that and and uh, receive something special from it. I guess so. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing stuff. I mean, we listen to music all the time, but I don't, don't really think we think about the way it's delivered to our brain. You know, um, I do from time to time, uh, and. Uh, you do as well because you're into recording engineering and, and the technology involved in that but uh, yeah most of the time it's a, an unconscious experience but when you do think about that I understand how uh, you know music gets encoded onto a record and then played by a needle and then received by the speakers and mm-hmm. it's still it's still miraculous to me it even is. though I understand it yeah well um I found this interesting. I sent this article to you. I, I don't know if you had a chance to check it out, but uh, there was a uh, Cambridge University study of 4,000 students, and they found a distinct correlation between brain types or thinking styles and their musical preferences. Um, and so the study divided uh, people into three groups, and you know we talked about pigeonholing and we all want to put people in in, in, in categories and stuff like this but it, it, it kind of makes a certain amount of sense and so the first group is called empathizers or type E and these are uh, people who focus on thoughts and emotions so yeah um, <clears throat> then there are systemizers type S uh, who focus on rules and systems mm-hmm um, and then finally, there's a balance type or type B who focus equally on both areas. Okay, okay. So that would suggest that we are somewhat predisposed predisposed to appreciating certain kinds of music. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. We're we're physically <clears throat> built uh, to to like certain types of music. Yeah. And then some people, I guess, you could frame it like right and left brain in a way, kind of. Uh, yeah. Equal combination of both, or some some level of balance there, and right, they get a little <coughs> bit from both E and S columns. Yeah. So, type uh, E thinkers tend to uh, like low energy songs, songs filled with emotion. That's that whole prolactin thing, including sad songs and genres like soft rock and singers songwriters. You know. Mm-hmm. Then uh, the uh, the type S thinkers uh, tend to prefer more intense or structured music, uh, like heavy metal, or okay. even classical music or avant-garde right. type music. Yeah. Um, and then type B uh, personalities uh, tend to display a broader range of preferences of either of those from either yeah. of those columns. <coughs> that so. makes sense, and I. I I assume that you and I are in the type B 
category. I feel probably. like I am. Yeah, I I, uh, I like so many different kinds of things. Um, yeah, and uh, I used to do for you kids uh, out here who don't know what a mixtape is. Um, <laughs> back in in the day, I used to make uh, mixtapes, and they were all. I had a series of mixtapes called Bad Mix. All right, and so basically, I would put like. Uh, you know the circle jerks next to uh, Doctor Shivago soundtrack. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, uh, <clears throat> next to the Beach Boys. Y- you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I don't know. If something about it really pleased me mm-hmm. to hear th- things that out of order uh, yeah. and uh, in- incongruent. I, um, I'm with you. I've done the same thing. Yeah. Um, by creating that that odd juxtaposition or stark contrast to my mind and and yours perhaps too it it kind of highlights both in a unique way as to what's great about them um, and and there's a, a aspect of unexpectedness you didn't expect that next thing to come on um, for us that tickles the brain and you go oh wow okay up against that previous song this has a whole different vibe about it or you know um, where some people might find that jarring and and oh yeah not enjoyable (laughs) yeah well it's funny because uh, there are songs that I put on those mixtapes that I like hear that song and then I go oh next is you know yeah um, yeah. my my brain started to anticipate yeah that uh, you know after Dr. Zhivago is going to be the Beach Boys or or or, uh, Fear or you know (laughs) something equally weird I I would enjoy these mixtapes very much okay well I still have them nice nice. you know when we do that show about physical media uh, I'll I'll, yeah you got to get to digitally archiving these I think I actually I've done a little bit of that but but not too much you need to preserve these ironic Ironically, not to go not to go on a tangent, but ironically, uh, the I took the mixtapes and I put them onto CDs. You did, okay. Yeah. Okay. The only problem is now the CDs are dying, but the mixtapes, yep. they're great. Yeah. They're still where they still work. So anyway, yeah, CDs you lose. Yeah. <laughs> Probably good sport uh, jumping off point to 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 take a quick break, but before I do. Uh, we got letters. We have a, a le- we somebody wow. uh, somebody sent us wow. a letter and this is a um, momentous day. To, yeah, to uh, <laughs> lopaz twenty twenty at gmail dot com. Uh, we I I've, I I'm it's kind of a sad thing, but I haven't actually gotten around to checking it until just recently. Oh. So anyway, um, well, like you said, there's only one of you. There is only yeah. one of me, <laughs> and and the world is probably a better place for that. Um, but this letter comes from a gentleman named uh, Neil Kushner. And he said, uh, thank you for your show and your interesting discussion. He likes Bjork, too. And he uh, wants to listen to the album that we referenced on a previous show. And he's wondering if uh, you've ever, if you, Bandon, have ever had a chance to uh, work with... Uh, uh, Blue Mojo, Blue Mojo programmable active filters for your recording and audio processing needs. Says he's not a salesman, but he, <laughs> he he's been playing around with it for years, and he's wondering if that's something that you that you've uh, gotten well, onto. Neil, I'm sorry to say, I'm not familiar with that at all. Okay, well, yeah. we'll we're going to do some checking now. Okay, yeah. Thanks yeah. for putting it on our radar. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I, I've only worked in, in very low-tech recording situations, so. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Thank All you right. for writing in, though. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Yeah. And, you know, be sure if you uh, if you have any questions or topics or anything, uh, be sure and, and send them along to us because we, we're interested in hearing from you. Yeah, even if you want to tell us to get off the air. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> especially, <laughs> especially, because you can't do anything about it. We're, you know... You, we're here, and yeah, you, it, this is it'd be very access. hard to stop us. It's public access, man. That's right. <laughs> so we're going to take a little bit of a break, uh, and we'll be back in one minute.
Welcome back to Low Pass Filter. Mateo Noche here, Band and Wayne there. We're talking about why we like the music we like. And um, we, we, you, you, everyone, the collective yeah, we, yeah. the big, wide world of we. We're, we're speaking for all of humanity. That's right. It might be a bit <laughs> presumptuous on our part, but <laughs> but anyway, that's we're, we are we're presumptuous people. So uh, it occurred to me in, in researching in this and looking at why people like certain things, um, uh, fandom is, is a reason to like things. Now, maybe you already liked it, but I think it kind of <coughs> intensifies your enjoyment sometimes of, of music to be a fan yeah. and to join in a group of fans um, liking music. Yeah, uh I don't know if I, I, I suppose I thought of it on some level. Um, yeah, so it almost could be a chicken or the egg kind of thing. Um, but perhaps we've gotten into certain musical sounds and styles because the group of friends we wanted to connect with were into it. Yeah. And maybe it wasn't necessarily a peer pressure thing, but you're drawn to these people, you're drawn to their attitude, their outlook on life. This is the music they like, and so you're kind of naturally drawn to that, perhaps. Um, maybe there's more of a uh, a cultural participation kind of thing that, that just seems appealing. Yeah. Um, well, if you think about the way fandom has evolved from, you know, the very earliest times of recorded music, um, you know, in the early days of music, um, you know, and even things like movies, I mean, they didn't often even necessarily put the artist's names on it, you know. Uh, so you were listening to something, you didn't really, you couldn't, like, find a picture of them. You know, yeah. of course, it was a different world. There was no Internet. There's, you know, um, you'd have to see them in a newspaper or a magazine. Yeah. Um, but as the years went on, um, then as that industry kind of grew up around it, you know, so there was... You know, fan fan magazines and stuff yeah. like that, and I, I I didn't think of this until just now, but I I think like the first real group of fans um, that I can kind of think back on is something like Frank Sinatra. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Frank Sinatra, I, I didn't put him on our list, but it just because this just came to me. Uh, but uh, back in the forties, um, he had a group of people that followed him around that were called Bobby Soxers. Ah, okay, yeah. And they would come to see Frank sing and swoon and scream, you know, like, uh, uh, I think mostly swooning. Maybe the screaming came later with the Beatles, but uh, um, but yeah. they they would follow Frank around. Wow. And in fact, uh, my my mom was one of these uh, Bobby Soxers. Wow. She uh, she <coughs> had this incredible uh, uh, autograph book, which unfortunately her mother threw away when she moved to New York. But anyway, she would follow Frank Sinatra and various, like Paul Whiteman and various orchestras and and, and bands, Tommy Dorsey and stuff like that around and. Uh, and get their autographs, you know. And stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, and and he was of an age when uh, there were special radio hours, special programs on the radio that would uh, certainly treat him like like a pop star of his era. And then he also crossed over into into television right. during those days, and so then people would get to see. You know, not just hear the voice, but see the person with the voice. And he was a pretty handsome, handsome young man, I think, of, of his yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. So fandom is a subculture, and fans share the empathy and camaraderie of a common interest. Uh, they're often very interested in minor details about the artist's life and career. They spend a significant amount of time and energy thinking about this kind of stuff. Um, and then there are fans there are fans of genres, you know, so they're like heavy metal fans. Anything yeah. that's metal is, is great. Or there's fans of just particular artists uh, within a genre. And, you know, music is completely subjective. This is the deal, you know, that yeah. that I you know, so like where I think we'll talk about this later about, you know, uh, people who end up not liking 
certain bands and or groups or artists for a certain were one reason or another. Usually, it's because they got played on the radio too much, yeah, uh, or they're associated with a socioeconomic group or whatever. Uh, but music is a completely subjective thing, and it's really what what we like, right? And uh, so when we when we talk about these fan groups, we're not trying to denigrate them. Not uh, at all. We, not at all. Uh, it just I, I just find it interesting that that they exist in the first place, and secondly, that you know unusual groups of people uh, like certain things. Um, so my first. On my first on the list uh, was uh, uh, BTS, which is a Korean boy band. Okay, yes, yeah, considered K-pop. K-pop. Yeah. And I have uh, uh, their, I think it's their breakout hit. It's called Mic Drop. Okay. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not a K-pop fan per se. I got really nothing against it, but uh, it's just a little too slick for me, and it seems, a little, I don't know, a little exploitive of youth. Um, but it could been, be. It's certainly geared towards youth. I would think more than anything. I'm sure there's adults who enjoy it too. Well, that's the interesting <laughs> thing, you see, because most of the K-pop fans are in their 30s and 40s. Really? Yes. The majority of K-pop fans are in their 30s and 40s, um, and a large contingent of these fans are middle-aged American women. Okay. I. I would not have guessed that. So, the question I guess comes up is: would be would be why? Um, why do middle-aged American women Man. relate to um, this music that's often in another language, that's uh, very youth-oriented, um, kind of a foreign, uh, foreign maybe not the word, but a different culture, and uh, you know, just a whole scene. Um, in 2019, uh, 10% of Vivid Seats, who was a ticket retailer, uh, their ticket traffic were U.S. women between 35 and 44. Um, <laughs> so why uh, why do a substantial amount of people go crazy over music that's not from their language and not from their culture? I don't know. I feel like you led off with a real curveball here. <laughs> I, I was not expect. I'm a little jarred. Ain't I a stinker? Yeah. <laughs> Man. Um, okay, yeah, I assumed it would be predominantly 10 to 14-year-old young people, maybe predominantly girls, but I, I would assume some young boys enjoy it too. I've seen uh, live performances or uh, television program performances uh, specifically of this group, um, uh, I had heard about K-pop, didn't know BTS was one of the real big ones until I came across it on YouTube or something. And went, oh, okay, I think there's five people in the group or something like that. Um, very stylish, cute, mm -hmm. maybe young adult men. Yes. Um, so I, I <laughs> it's kind of inexplicable, inexplicable, isn't it? I mean, I I'm sure I could get my brain in gear and, and start to to uh, you know come up with ideas as to why that they work for that demographic, but perhaps you you have well, I don't really have. I, this is why I'm asking you this question. <laughs> you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, I don't know. Part of me thinks this is like is, are are these. Uh, Women are are they feeling a motherly instincts, you know, for these young uh, men? And um, I I don't know. I it's or maybe it's a in uh, maybe it's an idealization of a of a young man that that you, you would have been attracted to at that time in your life or. You know, um, yeah. I can't help immediately making the comparison to other uh, what we called boy bands or or pop groups of the '80s and '90s, sure, um, like In Sync and Backstreet Boys. And now, of course, K-pop is just a total sort of emulation of it, that. It That's seems like that to me. Of, of, yeah, of it seems like bands. that to me. And so I'm thinking. Did those groups of of that time have the same demographic of fans? 
I don't know. We, we called it Teeny Bob. Sure. You know, we called it boy band, boy pop. Well, I mean, you could you could go farther back. Do you go to like the Partridge Family? Or, sure. Or, yeah. Or Bobby Sherman, or you know. Yeah, but but we know that that it was it seemed like predominantly teenagers liked that stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so what makes this appeal uh, to a different demographic than than that kind of pop music once did? Yeah, because because back in uh, in the sixties and seventies, there was also that common phrase, the generation gap. Yes, you know, music that our parents liked versus what we liked, and our parents did not relate whatsoever to to the stuff that was popular for the youth. So, yeah. this is an interesting one. Um, yeah. get, you know, if carry, you know, if you, if you <laughs> out there have an idea, yeah, uh, carry on if if you're in that demographic and you love it. Oh I, yeah, I got, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no. like again, you like what you like. I would then, think if it, if I was thinking about why I would appreciate it, I would think it would be because it sparks some or evokes some feeling that I once had mm-hmm. in my life from when I was younger, and and it kind of tickles that spot, and I enjoy um, experiencing that feeling. I don't yeah. know. Okay, <coughs> I'll do one more, and then and then we'll All jump right. onto your list. All right. Um, so this might be a dangerous area, but uh, Swifties. I don't know what you're talking about. Taylor Swift. Oh, <laughs> I was thinking of like something that you mop the floor with or something. Mm, well, it, it kind of <laughs> sounds like those are Swiffers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, sort of, the, sort of the same thing. But anyway, it had Taylor Swift all too well, the 10 minute yeah. version. Okay. okay. Uh, <clears throat> I, I don't know if there's a longer or shorter version. I, I'm, I'm ignorant, but I know my kids are, are big uh, uh, Swifties. Yeah. Uh, but uh, well, I wouldn't call them Swifties, but they do like Taylor Swift. But they are some of the world's most dedicated fans. Mm. Um, they create social media accounts, YouTube videos, and wow. fan art around her. Um, they uh, represent a digital ethnography, right? They are influenced and shaped by digitalization. So there, there's this huge on both on and offline world uh, for the Swifties, mm-hmm. uh, but they're closely related worlds. Um, Swifties are said to be transnational, super diverse, digital, and neoliberal. Hmm. Wow. Uh, and they have a strict strict set of rules for this world: no bullying, mm-hmm. no bad words. And no imitating Taylor. Wow. This is interesting stuff. I'm, yeah. I'm out of the loop on this. I certainly know who Taylor Swift is. Um, and I, I The other rule is that you must love Taylor unconditionally. Really? Yes. Okay. Now I want to parse this out because I think that that last rule and perhaps a couple of, of the other rules would be created from within the community. Yes. Um, Whereas um, I, I, I would be certain that the no bullying rule would, would be something that uh, she inspires. Yes. Um, and Well, she inspires it all, really. But certainly. Yeah. But, but I've seen footage of her and how she regards her audience at her shows. And uh, Billie Eilish is similar. Um, mm-hmm. Really um, it is important to them to... to uh, uh, make the the experience amongst all of their fans about a loving connection and lady gaga and there you go yeah yeah um and that i'm sure that's always existed on some level or with certain artists but that seems definitely of this time mm-hmm. because as you talked about there's that that online culture um and and that's so much of a of a an issue within online culture mm-hmm. um and these are modern young people who who are um, trying to kind of evolve away from um, you know a, a culture of, of bullying people and hazing and, and yeah, that's being admirable. rude and yeah. yeah yeah that's that's interesting but that that also denotes what a um, uh, specific culture there is around her and her music. It's also said that critical posts are deleted. Mm-hmm. There is no room for criticism of Taylor. <laughs> Not that there's anything to criticize, but let's just sure. say there were. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
That's an interesting topic unto itself. If you were to um, not allow critique, uh, at least of your art, right? Um, you know, it, I understand. I don't just think it's her. To, I don't think she's not allowing, and I think it's the community. Yeah. The, the, so yeah, so they have these kind of rules that may or may not be written somewhere. I'm I'm, I'm not sure. You just have to kind of learn the. You learn the ropes. I yeah, think, yeah. When you when yeah. you become a Swifty. <clears throat> yeah. There's a lot of philosophical stuff you could talk about within that, but but on a pure level, the idea of, of uh, trying to keep it all positive and full of love, nothing wrong with that. Sure, sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's jump over to your list. Man, my list is, is dated. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's not that much current stuff on my list. I was trying to wrap my head around this concept. Well, we'll start with the group that you suggested perhaps I field, which is uh, the group known as KISS. Yes. Um, and that registered to me as, as um, a good place to start thinking about this topic because KISS is about more than just the music. Uh, there are reasons people love KISS beyond or in addition to the music, maybe even preceding the music itself or... Mm-hmm. Um, some people feel like Kiss made completely empty, vapid music. Um, so, <laughs> so to love Kiss might suggest that it has much more to do with a cultural phenomenon and sure. the uh, the visual, the spectacle, the spectacle of Kiss, which I actually appreciate. <laughs> so, there's the Kiss Army. The Kiss Army. That's exactly right. Yeah. So it's it's beyond just. Um, and an abstraction of fans out in the world. It's decidedly coming together to to uh, love Kiss, worship Kiss, be part of a, a network of people that really, really love this band. Mm-hmm. Well, um, the reason I, I mentioned uh, uh, Kiss to you, uh, and, and because I w- wanted to talk about Insane Clown Posse. I saw that on your list, and I, I thought, well, is is Matt secretly a, a juggalo? Uh, <laughs> I ain't saying. <laughs> uh, but this isn't... Uh, I kind of the Kiss Army on steroids, really. They, they, um, the, they have fans. They're called juggalos. Um, Slipknot, Slipknot has maggots. Oh, okay. And... Uh, so they have juggalos. But I'm not going to say that I would call them that, but I, if they want to call themselves That's maggots, what they call themselves, yeah. apparently. Um, they hold an annual event called The Gathering, mm-hmm. which at one time, I think it's gotten a little smaller, but at one time they only had 100,000 people. It was big thing. for a minute. Yeah. yeah. Um, they get together and they, they spray each other with Fago, which is a soda. Yeah. <laughs> uh, listen to Horrorcore. I, I hadn't thought about this in a while, but yeah, the Fago... Um, they also paint their faces a la kiss. Mm-hmm. Uh, they wear hatchet gear and uh, do their hair and spider legs. They throw the west side uh, hand signs, do whoop and calls, uh, and have a mostly harmless obsession with murder. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, and, and I'm not in, in any way... Um, trying to disparage the people into this. Um, I didn't relate to it. I, I, you know, I, I was not destined to be in that family. Um, but, you know, as you just said, uh, mostly harmless obsession. Um, I, you know, Although there has been connected with them a smattering of gang violence. Okay, interesting. Uh, <clears throat> but incongruently... They also sponsor a number of charities. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, you know, working in the record store for a long time, um, you know, I I saw the uh, the rise in their album sales and um, saw, you know, fans who particularly loved this group, and um, they were all, you know, kind people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've seen uh, YouTube videos. I've seen uh, the family gathering, uh, 
events used to have these long um, promotional commercials um, that you could see on the internet. You know, it'd be 20, 30 minute like sort of trailers for the upcoming gathering event. And uh, yeah, they they were they were promoting a sense of, of community and connectedness, and it didn't seem angry or or dark or violent or anything. Um, but when in St. Cloud Posse first came along and sort of uh, was garnering this kind of cult level interest, as far as I could tell, they were considered kind of a, a rebellious, revolutionary minded kind of group. Um, you know, and they're hip hop horror core, I think would be a good Yeah, thing. but they were kind of anti authoritarian, kind of mm-hmm. anti fascist, kind of, yeah. you know. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's a great example. I was going to say, with the way they created that event called The Gathering, it's almost like Kiss meeting the Grateful Dead in a way. Right. Like well, I see. So I don't want to. I don't want to hog this whole thing. But but don't feel free. Man. But the the next thing I had on my list was the Grateful Dead, Dark Star. Certainly. Uh, and it seems that everyone is a deadhead. Except me, <laughs> I'm not. I, I must be the only person in the world that that. I, sometimes I feel like I am. I know that's not true, but I, I, I. If you look down the list of people who consider themselves deadhead, which include people like Bill Clinton and, uh, you know, just uh, a crazy amount of, of people that that are into the Grateful Dead, yeah, and yeah. and of course they're no longer a band because Jerry's gone. But at the time, um, they would have. Gatherings. They people would follow the band from city to city, yeah. making, selling, making and selling burritos and T-shirts, and and uh, doing the twirly twirly dance. And, and I think they sold other things that you could ingest as well. Yes, I think oh. they might they might have. <laughs> but it, but it's kind of like the other side of the insane clown posse thing, where you know uh, it's really like a culture that you immerse yeah. yourself in. Yeah, yeah, it really is, and and. Uh, it's where that line is between you heard the music and you decided I love this music therefore I'm going to join this culture and I've met people who are part of this culture and I want to connect with them I'm drawn into that and then the music becomes um, part of your life that way I don't know where that line is but I'm sure people fall on it's kind of the same <coughs> impulse, right? Insane Clown Posse, Grateful Dead. It's 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 just I find it relatively diametrically opposed sort of music. <laughs> yeah. I find it relatively similar the the cultural aspect of it, or the reason you would connect with with the culture, not not from the whatever the values within it are, but just you're drawn to it inexplicably for some reason. Yeah. Um, I'm not a deadhead either, but I think. Maybe before I leave this mortal coil, I might become one. I, I've been working on it for years. I, yeah. I just kind of recently discovered that the sort of uh, later 70s into the 80s Grateful Dead is sounding really good to me right now. Right. So well, see, this is my problem because I like, I like that better than, yeah. than, the, well, than like the early 70s uh, you know, meanderings. And I don't think there's anything tune, wrong with that. Out of tune guitar playing. <laughs> <laughs> hey uh, now, hey now. We're, uh, yeah, I so know. Like, I'm inviting trouble. So we're get, we're talking like Shakedown Street to in the dark. Terrapin kind of, Station. The terrapin, oh, I really love that. The Terrapin record. Suite is amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, not to get stuck on the dead, but yeah, that's one of the best examples I think of what we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. Um, and feel free to to you know carry on I, well we're I gonna don't. we're gonna take another break all right and then when we come back i i, I want to get to more stuff on your list uh but we're gonna take a quick break we'll be back in just a couple minutes with some more low pass filter Thank you. 
Welcome back to Low Pass Filter. We're talking about why we like what we like and why you like what you like. Um, although we don't know what you like and that's your own business. We're not going to get up in your in your grill about it or anything else like and that. We respect it. We respect you. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, a couple things on your list and talk about what you what All you. All right. Like. An interesting one, I'm not sure if you have much familiarity with, but uh, the group Man of War. Um, I don't know them. It, uh, it kind of would fit in the discussion with Kiss and, and Insane Clown Posse, perhaps, uh, because there's kind of a, an exaggeration in their, their image and presentation um, uh, beyond the music and... Um, their first album is probably close to 40 years old now, um, and they continue to have a, a, an ardent uh, cult fan base. Um, I happen to love this band, at least. Awesome. In You're their, a fan. I am a fan. Uh, never got into the culture of Man of War, never been to one of their concerts. Um, but I do know other people who love this group as well, and I know people who can't stand this group, right. specifically within the heavy metal community. Um, Man of War, uh, on all of their album covers, represented this kind of um, this um, northern white European Viking type character, um, very buff, Game, Game well, of Throny. yeah. Before that, and um, they were Game of Thrones before there was Game of Thrones. Uh, they definitely were, and, and kind of uh, before there was even something called Viking metal. Okay. Um, and the subject, of course, <laughs> of course there is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the subject matter of their their music is basically from within the the, the realm of the sagas, uh, the sagas of the of the Vikings. Um, Viking warriors, um, but the thing about them is, they're it's all tongue in cheek. Okay. Um, they take the music they make seriously. They enjoy the music they make, um, but it's clear to me that that it's not a joke, but it's tongue in cheek. And one way that you can can know that is that the the founder of the group, the guitar player Ross the Boss, came from a group called the Dictators. Oh, yes. And they were also very tongue-in-cheek. I've seen the Dictators. Yeah. There you go. So uh, so it would seem to me Ross the Boss liked the idea of this emergent heavy metal style and came up with this concept. The members of the band would dress like... Um, kind, of, kind of like Viking warriors or... or Conan the Barbarian. Have, have horned helmets. Uh, yeah, maybe even early on it was more about like the Conan the Barbarian kind of okay. thing, and then kind of evolved into Frank um, Franzetta. Yeah, know. so so that their album covers are Frazetta style artwork, um, representing the band in an exaggerated way. So that so the right the guys in the band didn't really look like they weren't that buff. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Um, and I don't know too much about this culture, but I know it exists. And to this day, there are still people who go to Man of War shows. Ross, the boss, left Man of War years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so they aren't even uh, all of the original members. But So people love this band. Uh, you know, nowadays, you've got men in their 50s and 60s, probably, that, that go to their concerts, as well as younger people who've discovered it, too. Um, so it's in the Spotify list. Check out... Check out Man of War if you're interested. Okay. And some people hate them. <laughs> I have a friend who, who likes um, another Viking metal band called Amon Amarth that, that is much more serious, and he, this friend of mine, hates Man of War. He mm -hmm. thinks they're trash. Mm -hmm. But I love it, and I think they're great. I'm going to have to, I'm gonna have to explore this a little, <laughs> a little more. <clears throat> so I, I threw in uh, Carl Stockhausen. Interesting. Okay. So Carl Stockhausen was a pioneer of electronic music. Um, they have this type of music that's called serial composition. Okay. And uh, control change. 
So uh, it's like very mechanical. I think your your type E uh, person would yeah. would be big yeah. on this. And I'm, I may cut this out, but I'm going to do my imitation of, of minimalist music. <laughs> Blink. That's pretty good. It's it's kind of like that. I have quite a few records like that, and that's what they sound like. Yeah. And that's why I love them. Who likes this type of music? That's what I like to know. We do. We <laughs> <laughs> Are there fans? <coughs> Do yeah, people like getting yeah, a t-shirt, the Carl Stockhausen t-shirt? And, and I don't know about sporting t-shirts, um, at least not that you'd pick up at Hot Topic or something like that. <laughs> um, you know, there might be some homemade ones. There, there could be, maybe there's a website where you can go and buy, you know, might have some ironic quote on it or something. I don't know, the music is just so <laughs> austere. And just like sort of death camp sonatas, you know, they're just like so, <laughs> they're just, uh, but they're, it's a thing and they sell records and yeah. people go to concerts and, you know, I, I'm just, I'm just trying to picture yeah. why some, I'm not putting down on it by it, but, uh, but I'm just, what, it's the attraction, I guess. So I guess if you went to a concert today of, Stockhausen music it would be a group of musicians in a, a kind of you know theater that you might see classical performances or opera or musical plays something like that you'd hear people uh, render these compositions and well whatnot. Steve Reich there you go yeah. still out there I think he's still still out there doing it um Maybe somebody like John Adams. I think he's maybe even would be considered melodic. I think probably by comparison yeah. to Stockhausen. But uh, but yeah, it's just I just wonder. You know, I, I looked online to see if there was some sort of community that you know that formed around this. And either there isn't one, or they're all you know in denial or hiding very well. I'm not. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I I, I mean. We could assume that there's a group of people getting together to discuss almost any topic under the sun. It, uh, somewhere, there's probably a convention, yeah. probably not as big as a, a Swifty convention or a Comic Con or Star Trek convention, even maybe. But there's there's somewhere a, they're there, gathering. There's people getting together um, uh, in honor of Paul Williams somewhere. Oh, in I the can, world, can, so there's I probably can understand that. yeah. So the, so we're talking about little Paul Williams. Yes, or, indeed. Yeah, yeah, there's actually a documentary. That, yeah, that somebody that stole my song. <laughs> 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 there is a documentary about that. Um, uh, that can rainy days and Mondays is a freaking oh amazing song. We've so. only just begun. Yeah, there you go. I, I love Paul Williams. Yeah, He's a great songwriter, and he was on the Muppet Show, um, and. Uh, yeah, I think bringing up Stockhausen, that, that's a great one. Um, the, there's got to be, the, I'm, I'm sure there's like a Reddit page, Reddit threads, that, you know, people, yeah. there's people that, that come together, they find each other over this kind of stuff, but maybe not as big of a pop culture phenomenon. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't think there is a phenomenon involved. But, and uh, you mentioned the, uh, what was it, the... The type S. Yeah, uh, type S um, focuses on rules and systems. Yeah, and so so I could see like insane clown posse or man of war, you know that kind of uh, you know very regimented. Um, perhaps yeah, um, but so they don't do the Cookie Monster vocal thing, do they? In man of war? No, no, no. Okay, no, thank, thank, no. It's more of the the operatic epic metal kind of. Got vibe. it. Got it. Well, let's do one more each, and then we're going to have to call it, because I think, that as the, uh, the thing just told us, we're just about out of time. Yeah. Well, okay, so I put Dave Matthews' band on my list. Uh, that's a good Did one. Did that make sense? That does make, that makes um, a hell of a lot of sense. It's an artist I never got into, but I respect uh, uh, predominantly for his, his musicianship and his musicality. He's clearly... 
uh, a great musician and surrounds hi- himself. The people in his band are talented musicians, mm-hmm. you know, kind of of a higher academic South level African. of musicianship. Uh, he was South yeah. African, yeah. yeah. Um, um, but he has, you know, jazz, funk, rock musicians in his band that are technically proficient. Um, and I don't know what the what the subculture for Dave Matthews is today, but but kind of in uh, in the mid '90s to late '90s, uh, maybe into the early 2000s, there was a a, a decided fanship of him. Uh, I, I don't know if they had conventions or had internet groups. Secret handshakes. Yeah, it's po- possibly secret Dave Matthews handshakes. It probably involved. A little leg wiggle too, <laughs> um, but uh, my my oldest sister, who's who's six years younger than me, um, he really struck a chord with her, and he she still loves him. And I think one of the reasons I th- thought of Dave Matthews is because not only is there a strong fanship that could be on a cult level for Dave Matthews, cult sounds a, a, a little bit dark or something, but. Um, uh, there's also a sense of, of guilt in the love of his music. People go, ah, I know it's, it's you know, people think it's corny, but I love Dave Matthews. And so I was kind of thinking about how... Um, some well, you know, it could be Hootie and the Blowfish, so there yeah, you go. And, and, <laughs> and that could almost be a parallel, although Hootie was maybe a, just a little bit more pop and kind of came and went a little quicker than than Dave Matthews. Um, I have a friend who loves both, who's who's uh, makes sense. eight or nine years younger than me, and that was from his era coming, you know, up in junior high and high school, and and so you know, he he loves artists like that um, because it connected with him at at a certain time in his life. Um, but he still appreciates the musicality and the sentiment in the music and mm-hmm. the emotional content. But yeah, so I th- I, I kind of suspect that there's kind of a network of Dave Matthews fans. I I, th- I, th- I think they find each other at mm-hmm. least at his concerts. You know, they probably recognize each other from across the crowded room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, last one. There's more, but I but uh, I think we we're, we're just about out of time. So let me just throw in one more uh, clinker here. Uh, Air Supply. Wow. All out of love. I have on my list. Does, does um, I hear Air Supply is touring again. Good for them. Uh, but this is kind of the soft rock thing. Yeah. Or, or what? Which type do we have? To, our type E people who who like thoughts and emotions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and soft rock is a whole thing too, you know. But there is a air supply community out there. There's a whole group how, of people. How do you know this? I, I right the research you, department. You're, you're, you you have a card in your wallet that says you're a member. I'm a secret air supply. Uh, <laughs> I'm a secret air supply person. Um, but yeah, soft rock, uh, which uh, eventually became adult contemporary music. Um, but That's it's like this simple <clears throat> melodic songs, big lush, lush productions, kind of uh, emotional um, uh, lyrics. But it turns out that they are huge in South America. Wow. Particularly in Chile, Peru, and Brazil. Wow. And their fans are called Airheads. Go figure. Not I don't know su- what that would mean. Not Air Supply but Heads. But and airheads, the airheads, <laughs> and there's tons of different social networking <clears throat> related to this band. There's, there's. I think that's kind of too bad that they had to settle on airheads. <laughs> I, I understand that that rolls off. It, it sounds a little derisive, but, doesn't it? Yeah, like if, to to be a fan of this band, you have to be an airhead. You can <laughs> be empty-headed or something. But, I mean, deadhead can be much better, right? <laughs> because it means from the neck up, there's not much yeah. going on. <laughs> I, I did not ever think of it that way. Um, that's that's interesting. Uh, do, do they do they have more than that one song? They, they do, yeah. 
Yeah, they they had a string of hits in the, in, yeah. uh, in the 70s and early 80s. I guess that figures. I may be aware of other songs by them, but All I've Loved, that's the one that, yeah. uh, that you hear on the radio. Well, thanks for watching Low Pass Filter. Uh, be sure and like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, and, uh, you know, be sure and hit us up with your comments. Um, hopefully uh, the comments will be nice to us after some of the people that we've, <laughs> that we've talked about in this show. But, uh, Bandit, thanks for being here. Thank as you. Always. Thanks for That's having a me. Great one, as always. And we'll see you again next time on Low Pass Filter. Thanks for watching Low Pass Filter. at lowpassfilter2020 at gmail.com Be sure to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell to be notified about future shows.